How to build a railgun, accidentally. Story from a friend who was electrician. From his days as an apprentice and how those days almost ended him. He was working, along other professionals, in some kind of industrial emergency power room. Not generators alone mind you, but rows and rows of massive batteries, intended to keep operations running before the generators powered up and to take care of any deficit from the grid side for short durations. Well, a simple install was required, as those things always are a simple install in an awkward place under the ceiling. So up on the ladder our apprentice goes, doing his duty without much trouble and the minimal amount of curses required. That is, until he dropped his wrench, which landed precisely in a way that shorted terminals on the battery bank he was working above. An impressively loud bang and probably a couple pissed pants later, and the sad remains of the wrench were found on the other side of the room, firmly embedded into the concrete wall. Fun Fact Tools for use in the battery compartment of a submarine are intentionally shorter than the distance between the terminals to prevent this from happening. Stupid question, but couldn't they just make non-conductive tools? When you are on a submarine you probably want them to be as durable as possible too. So what you're saying is, $10 billion R&D contract followed by an indefinite contract to supply every ship in the fleet with $5 million composite wrenches. More like $10 billion R&D contract followed by $5 million composite prototype where they then determine that old steel 1 is 1% the cost and 90% is durable lol. But it's conductive. And they solve that problem by making tools that are too small to touch both contacts of the terminals. More than one way to solve a problem like that. Solutions like that are good. There is no failure state. The tool can't magically get bigger. A coating can definitely wear off or be dissolved by some combination of factors nobody thought of. It's provably impossible versus it's probably impossible. Accidentally put two tools together end to end. But that's much less likely. Accidents mitigated for 95% of situations that aren't someone doing it on purpose. It's still 100% safe for the using a single tool or using an unmaintained tool scenarios. But yes, there are still ways to feep it up. Just not those specific ways a coded tool can fail. Growing up. My sister participated in cheerleading competitions which meant that she accumulated a vast number of ribbons, medals, and trophies, all of which she hung above her bed attached to the wall. One night, one of the cheap medals she won broke under its own weight and fell off the wall, falling down and landing precisely across two prongs of her alarm clock electrical cord that was plugged into the wall but Juu is slightly pulled out in a way where the top part of the plug was exposed. A short happened and sparks flew burning the electrical plug plate to black and smelling horrible before the circuit breaker tripped. None of us could figure out the cause of the problem as we kept switching the breaker back on but it kept shorting. This was so dangerous. I can't even imagine the power those big electrical breakers could have. And this is why so many UK electricians feel superior. Sure our plugs are big and ugly, but the design goals were safety and ruggedness and by god they managed it. This is one of the top arguments for why you should install American plugs upside down. That way if anything falls it contacts the ground plug not the live contacts. I've flipped all my plugs at home. Everyone asks why till I point out that was the intended design. But everyone wants little surprised face sockets I guess. It may have been the intended design I have not heard that before but too many wall ward adapters with polarized plugs can only safely plug in in the normal orientation. Wait, shouldn't it be fine since the whole outlet is upside down? Or am I missing something? Wall ward adapters are designed to hang with the center of mass below the outlet connection. When it is upside down the higher center of mass can cause the adapter to come loose, exposing the plug conductors and creating the exact electrocution slash fire hazard that upside down outlets were meant to prevent. The term crowbarring is this kind of thing. Find the heaviest metal thing usually a crowbar and short the power with it to discharge all remaining energy. After disconnecting the mains. Conversion of the crowbar to plasma and the technician to molten flesh is often the end result of forgetting the last step. Apparently this is slash was standard procedure when servicing subway tracks. After the people in charge of it assure you they turn the power off, you throw a crowbar to short the third rail and make completely sure it's actually off. Nearly sure it still is. And in London where the subway has a third and fourth rail, they have a specially designed bar to short it. I used to work in a boat yard as an apprentice carpenter. We outfitted 25-meter steel-hulled high-end yachts, I. E. Took in a bear hull and then put out a fully speckied yacht ready for the water. These things had a lot of electrical stuff on board so typically would have a whole bunch of 12V batteries in parallel. One day one of the guys I'll call him Ray because that was his name dropped a spanner across the terminals of the end battery in a bank of 8 what were essentially 12V truck batteries. Almighty bang followed by muffled cursing, 
the spanner went straight up, through 8mm sheet steel decking, 5mm of epoxy resin, 6mm marine plywood and then an inch of teak deck, the roof. Left a hole Ray could stick his head through and we never did find the spanner, I learned a lot of respect for zappy boxes after that, and learned that Ray was a bit special, other Ray incidents, not locking the 2 feet diameter blade on the bench saw last seen punching a hole in the ceiling. We never found it which is, worrying in a residential area. Working in an enclosed space with contact adhesive and no ventilation Ray spent the next hour out on the grass in the sun smiling vaguely to himself. Cleaning the oil and dirt off his car engine with petrol then firing up the engine, literally. It was always exciting working with Ray. The spanner went straight up, through 8mm sheet steel decking, 5mm of epoxy resin, 6mm marine plywood and then an inch of teak deck, the roof. Hmm. Looks like a good place to put an inspection hatch for the battery compartment. And a sunroof. A pair of mating crows a protected species here in the UK decided to make their nest on the girders of the local power station which fed our facility. At one point, a branch fell from the nest, shorting out a 35 kV line, and causing a cascading failure which led to the power station going down. Hard. No crows were harmed, but our workplace, the main user of the power station, went dark for two days whilst they repaired the damage. Part of the reason it took so long was because it's against the law to disturb protected species with fledglings. Everything is protected here, even seagulls. Aviation electrician friend of mine was working in a load center on a large aircraft, where all the power distribution from the engine generators to the various onboard systems happens, using a ratchet to tighten down a nut holding a cluster of wire ends to a terminal strip lug, and inadvertently touched the other end of the ratchet to another terminal lug. Electricity. Float. He was fine, but the socket was permanently spot welded onto the ratchet handle. I had a wrench jump while putting on the positive terminal for a minivan. Shorted it to the frame. In the time it took me to see what happened and try to pull it back off the wrench had gotten so hot that when I grabbed it and tried to pull it took a bunch of skin off my hand. I ran, grabbed a pry bar and popped it off before it could explode and then got another 20 seconds before the pain really set in. It was awful. I had a lot of trouble working one-handed for the next month while my hand healed. I was taught to connect the positive first and cover it up to prevent this exact situation. Dunno if it's more dangerous for other reasons though. I am ashamed that my first thought about this was yeet. The second was trying to imagine how all the participation things must have lined up just right to lead to this incident. Jokes aside, lucky guy. Let's call railguns eaters. Oi blimey, that's a big eater you got there some space Australian. Probably. That is one reason all tools that are going to be used in those areas are designed with all metal parts insulated by a thick rubber sheathing so that you have an absolute minimum of exposed bare metal available. Your adjustable spanner should have been one with an insulated handle, which is a common tool, and you also get insulated tools for this use, used in high voltage areas where there is a chance equipment may be energized, or where you are working live. For hazardous areas with a risk of gas all tools are required to be non-sparking, so all are going to be made from a bronze a lot, most commonly one containing beryllium as a component, as the alloy is both non-sparking, and very strong as well as being light in mass so making use easier. Wrenches with isolated handles aren't that common here in Germany, and I assume they would have used that if they had planned to work on anything related to the actual system, not just adjacent to it. Wrenches with isolated handles aren't that common here in Germany. Funny enough the standard for electrically isolated equipment which is accepted pretty much worldwide is the German VDE standard. It's common to see on screwdrivers for electricians, maybe a bit less so on wrenches. We build and export a bunch of amazing stuff. China's newest high-speed trains are made in Germany, while the ones driving here, let's say not the latest and greatest. An across-the-room spanner. Railgun using strong electromagnetic fields to propel a projectile. What your buddy did is create a small arc flash by shorting battery terminals. It sounds like he was working inside a UPS battery room, which is one of the most dangerous places in a critical power facility. Not just thanks to the dangerous voltage but also the extremely high current availability which will vaporize almost anything that creates an electrical fault, the presence of hydrogen gas which is normally exhausted continuously by fans, and the jars full of strong sulfuric acid. There's a reason many building operators keep the doors to battery rooms separately key locked from other areas. Railgun typically using strong electromagnetic fields to propel a projectile. FTFY. It is not a requirement to use electromagnetic fields, only that the projectile is driven by a linear motor. In today's tech, that is often most effectively done through electromagnetic fields. 
Linear motors by definition use electromagnetic fields. Back in the dark ages when I worked as a production planner for an automotive OEM we had something similar happen. I was sitting at my desk when we heard what can only be described as a very loud cannon go off. I looked out the window into the factory and half of the lights were off and the machines were down. We were running lean on inventory so every minute we were down caused problems for the planners. I ran into the factory and looked around. I saw all the maintenance guys running for a stairway that was just part of the scenery to me. So I followed them up the stairs. We went into the room with all of the transformers for the building. A technician was in the room working on the transformers and evidently made some mistake. When he flipped the power lever it blew a fuse about 2 inches in diameter and 6 inches long and everything went dark around him. He was too frightened to move. He was white as sheet as the saying goes, and had to be helped out of the room by the maintenance guys. Our electrician went in and at this point they chased me out. They restored power in about an hour and it took us another half hour to get the machines all back online and running smoothly. Was he wearing his brown pants? Building transformers are no joke. They generally have unlimited power available and bad things can happen. Check YouTube for arc flash videos if you want to see the gory details. NSFW. I remember hot work procedures for a previous employer. The process only left an hour to do the job before lunch. So everyone on the team decided to work through lunch so the job could be finished before the end of the day. A variation on the 1980 Damascus, Arkansas Titan missile explosion. Where the tech dropped a socket and it punctured the first stage fuel supply. With ultimately the whole missile blowing out of the silo. Thankfully, only a broken arrow and not a nuke flash. The FPEEP makes fuel supplies out of paper mache. Can someone please explain the physics of this interaction? I have a high school slash early college level understanding of electric and magnetic fields. Here are two explanations further up the comments. L underscore Minadero. Nope, just parallel wires. FILXB where X is a cross product, and L in this case is the wrench length and vector. Jasky original poster. I'm sure that is an excellent explanation. Far as I understand, wrench touches bus bars long strips of copper lots of current starts flowing. Something something right hand rule. Strong magnetic field is generated which is not in line with the field of the bus bars, resulting in the wrench being magnetically heated. Maybe add a bit of expanding cloud of vaporized steel to that. If the wrench stayed in place maintaining the short circuit, it would have caused a shed load of heat until a fusible link blew or the battery went flat. I'm just guessing, but when the wrench's second contact got close to its terminal, or after it bounced off, attempting to interrupt the short, it probably caused a DC arc through the air. Arc flashes will happily kill you and then incinerate your corpse, they would easily have explosive force to shoot a wrench off at high velocity. 